Mr. Chauncey, I believe, is on the stand. Yes, here he is. And, Your Honor, as Professor Chauncey is coming to the stand, I wanted to report uh, that we were able to agree that all the exhibits that the plaintiffs wanted to move into evidence last evening, we have no objection. So if they have a list uh, that they want to provide, uh, we, we're fine with that. In addition, uh, there was, uh, I believe it was PX 1770. Five, we had a uh, authenticity objection to. We withdraw that authenticity objection, and I think Ms. Stewart has a better copy of it, and she can explain that situation. All right, Ms. Stewart. Good morning, Your Honor. Um, we um, yesterday, Mr. Thompson was concerned that the exhibit that um, was in the binders was a black and white copy that was a little bit blurry, and so there's another. Uh, uh, exhibit that's been marked that's the same document that actually is in color and has no blurriness. It's, it's, I just wanted to ask the court um, for your preference. The plaintiff exhibit number that the cleaner copy is is 2288, but I thought it might make sense to remark it the same as the other exhibits so that the record is clear because the witness referred to the document. And the, the blurrier version of it was exhibit 1775. So uh, I can do whichever, um, but I, I, would, I thought what I would do is just mark these 1775 and during a break substitute them in the binders that the court has so that we replace the blurry copy with the clean one. Why don't instead you file this as 775A? Perfect. <laughs> Thank you, Your Honor. And um, also if the... Be complete as to uh, which documents are being referred to. Um, if the court would um, allow me to, I, I had uh, requested that um, the court allow me to um, have this list become an exhibit so that I could then ask the court to admit the documents that are on the list as uh, Dr. Chauncey's sources rather than have him, you know, read those sources into the record just to spare us the extra time. And so I'd like to ask that the list that Mr. Thompson was referring to that they have now agreed to of exhibits um, that would come in through Mr. Chauncey to be marked. Um, what, what, are, what are we up to in next in order for plaintiffs? Uh, plaintiffs next in order. Guys? Well, what you have, I gather, is simply a list of those exhibits that are coming in. Correct, Your Honor. Why don't you hand those to the clerk, and we'll go through the exhibit Perfect. lists, and we'll mark those as as entered, and that should take care of the problem, should it not? Yes, yes Your Honor. And I'll, we'll provide the physical exhibits themselves um, to the court at a break. Good. Well, I appreciate that, counsel. We're moving along. All right, Mr. Thompson. Now, Mr. Chauncey, you're still under oath. You understand that, do you? The oath that you took yesterday applies to this testimony as it did to the testimony yesterday. Is that clear? Is that clear? Yes, sir. Very well. Uh, good morning, Professor. Good morning. Um, is it fair to say that as an historian, you are most struck by how quickly public opinion is changing in regard to the recognition of same-sex relationships? Uh, I think that as a historian, I'm struck both by a change in opinion and by the polarization of American society and the roadblocks that have been put in uh, place uh, to prevent uh, the achievement of marriage equality for gay couples. Well, I, I'd like to direct your attention to tab six in your binder, which is uh, excerpts from your book, Why Marriage, which has been uh, introduced into evidence in the list that was just handed uh, to the court. And I'd like to direct your attention to uh, page 12 in Roman numerals. So this would be the introduction. So it's, it's tab six and then Roman numeral 12, which is towards the beginning in the introduction. Um. Are you the, tell me when you're there, Professor. I don't mean to rush you, but... Uh, yes, I was... Okay. Mm -hmm. and, and so you, you said in the first full paragraph, nonetheless, as a historian, I am most struck by how quickly public opinion is changing in regard to the recognition of same-sex relationships. You wrote that, correct? 
Um, I did write that. I wrote that you in, know, in I, 2004. The, the question and is just whether you wrote that. On redirect, you can explain whatever you like. Um, and when you wrote that, you agreed with it, correct? Uh, yes, I thought this in 2004. Yes, okay, very well. Um, now, in 2002, Gallup did a poll that showed that even though 44% of people said homosexuality was an unacceptable alternative lifestyle, 86% thought homosexuals should have equal rights in terms of job opportunities, correct? Sorry, wait, what year did you mention? 2002. It, I, I'll, I can repeat the question if you'd like. Uh, in, in 2002, Gallup did a poll that showed that even though 44% of the people said homosexuality was an unacceptable alternative lifestyle, 86% thought homosexuals should have equal rights in terms of job opportunities. Is that right? Uh, I would have to look at the source again, but that seems possible to me. Okay. Um, and, and the contrast was, was even more striking among African Americans who were more supportive of gay civil rights than whites, even though they also expressed more moral disapproval of homosexuality, correct? I remember that being a general trend. Uh, and, and when Matthew Shepard was uh, murdered, it provoked a national outcry, correct? Uh, it received considerable attention, yes. And it was clear that a profound change had taken place, correct? Uh, well, I believe that I was referring there to um, a growing recognition of the problem of violence against gay people uh, and that it ought to be um, uh, considered a problem, even though it continued at considerable length. But, but there was a, there had been a remarkable growth in acceptance of gay people in our own time, correct? There has been? Uh, as I think I've said throughout my work, there's been both a growth and a growing polariz of support for gay people and a growing polarization of American society over gay issues. As recently as 2000, civil unions seemed like a radical idea, correct? I, yes. And in Vermont, Governor Howard Dean was denounced for supporting civil unions at the beginning of the last decade, correct? Yes, that's correct. But every major Democratic candidate for president supported civil unions in the 2004 primary, correct? Uh, they supported civil unions, but not marriage. And that would have been unthinkable just four years earlier, correct? Uh, it did mark a change, yes. yes. Indeed, even President George W. Bush sought to moderate his image by supporting the rights of states to enact civil unions for gay couples, correct? Uh, in a roundabout way, yes. <laughs> and more telling evidence of the growing public support for gay couples was provided by several state legislatures, correct? Uh, you'll have to tell me what you're referring to there. Well, the, the legislatures of New Jersey and Maine uh, passed laws providing a degree of recognition and security to gay couples, correct? Uh, yes, there were a handful of states that did that, while many others um, enacted significant barriers to marriage. And, and California has enacted a sweeping domestic partnership law that granted registered gay couples all of the state benefits available to married couples. Yes or no? Yes. In 2004, exit polls showed that 60% of voters nationwide support either civil unions or marriage for gay couples, right? Uh, yes, I believe it was about a th half of those for um, marriage and then the others just for civil unions, so they drew a distinction between the two. Are, are you aware of any more recent polling data on that issue? Um, I can't give you the particulars on the most recent polls. My sense is that broadly there's still um, about a third support for marriage and about a third support for civil unions or domestic partnership, um, but not marriage. And the generational shift is especially noteworthy. Americans in their late teens and 20s are four times more likely to support same-sex marriage than their grandparents are, correct? Um, I believe uh, that figure was true 
at one point. I think that trend is generally true. It's, of course, hard to know what will uh, happen with that trend, but that would be a fair assessment of the current polling data. The year stretching from the spring of 2003 to the spring of 2004 were a decisive turning point in the history of lesbians and gay men in the United States, correct? Uh, well, I believe uh, when I said that, I um, was referring both uh, to the uh, recognition of marriage by the Massachusetts State Court and the enormous debate that emerged. And so it was a decisive turning point in the sense that the issue had really been brought to the fore. Uh, and of course, tremendous opposition was generated as well as support. And it's hard to think of another group whose circumstances and public reputation have changed so decisively in so little time, correct? Um, I think in looking back over the last generation, it is really striking how much has changed and how many impediments uh, remain before gay people and how strong resistance has been to that change. Above all, there's been a sea change in the attitudes of the young who've grown up in a world where they know gay people and see them treated with the respect any human deserves, correct? Uh, I think that there has been a change on the part of young people, yes. And I'd like to direct your attention to tab nine in your binder. And this is a, a website entitled beyondhomophobia.com. It's um, written by uh, Dr. Herrick, who's a expert in this case. And, and do you know of Dr. Herrick's reputation? Uh, yes. All right. A and he has a, a, a solid reputation in his field? Uh, yes. All right. And I, I'd like to direct your attention to page four of this document. Uh, by Professor Herrick, uh, and looking at the fourth paragraph from the bottom, the second sentence reads, uh, the widespread opposition to Proposition 8 and the fact that proponents of the measure have been so careful not to publicly bash sexual minorities are signs of a sea change in public attitudes. Do you agree with Professor Herrick? Well, as I suggested yesterday, I uh, do think that the Prop 8 campaign and certainly its most public official manifestations was um, much more polite than uh, many of the earlier campaigns, though I believe they also um, drew on some of the fears um, that were resonant because of those earlier campaigns. In the colonial era, uh, sodomy laws regulated conduct in which anyone could engage, correct? I'm sorry, repeat. I just, oh, yes. repeat yourself, yeah, please. Yes, in the colonial era, sodomy laws regulated conduct in which anyone could engage, correct? Uh, well, again, there were variations amongst the states as a sort of general rubric uh, that would be fine, but that would be qualified by looking at um, the, the, the laws that, that affected uh, primarily the regulated male sexual behavior. The uh, prohibition against sodomy was not the same thing as anti-gay discrimination, correct? Uh, yes, as I said yesterday, that was uh, not the same thing. Although anti-gay discrimination is popularly thought to have ancient roots, in fact, it is a unique and relatively short-lived product of the 20th century, correct? Well, as I've suggested, the, um, the um, hostility towards such behavior um, can be seen in the sodomy laws, even though they didn't apply just to homosexual conduct. Um, but in that sentence, I was referring to the construction of an edifice of anti-gay discrimination and hostility in the context of the 20th century when the categories of gay and straight, heterosexual and homosexual uh, became uh, culturally powerful. But, but you agree with the sentence I read, correct? <laughs> if you would read the sentence again, please. Sure. Uh, the, the prohibition against sodomy was not the same thing as anti-gay discrimination, correct? Yes. All right. 
Oh, and, sorry, uh, although anti-gay discrimination is popularly thought to have ancient roots, in fact, it is a unique and relatively short-lived product of the 20th century, correct? Well, there again, I'm uh, drawing a distinction between hostility uh, towards behavior and uh, discrimination against a class of people based on that, defined by that behavior. And so in that sense, yes, uh, discrimination is a product of the 20th century. And the states began to enact discriminatory measures in the 1920s and 30s against homosexuals, correct? Yes. Now, in your direct, you mentioned, uh, you discussed uh, discrimination in the context of bars and, uh, do you remember that? Yes. Okay. And uh, gay bars were an important battleground in the post-war years, correct? Yes. Beginning in the 1930s and 40s, many states, including California, prohibited gay people from being served in bars and restaurants, correct? Yes. But raids on bars of gays and lesbians are a thing of the past in California today, correct? Um. I can't give you a definitive answer on that. I mean, clearly, um, they're not a part of the landscape now in the way they were then. So, so that's, and indeed, throughout the United States, uh, gays and lesbians are uh, free to go, are legally entitled to go to any bar they wish to, correct? Uh, they are now. Um, hmm. Well, uh, I would guess that in half the states, there's still no um, laws prohibiting discrimination against them. Um, and so um, it could still, they could still be ejected in bars in, let's say, half the states. Are you aware of any police raids on any bars in the United States that have taken place in the last 10 years because the bar was serving gays and lesbians? Um, well, last summer, the police did arrest a number of patrons at a bar in Fort Worth, Texas. Um, and there was a big controversy about why they had done this. Um, any other any other incidents in the last 10 years? Um, not that I can think of now. And in the meta, the, let's turn to the medical community and, and the discrimination that was present there. In the early part of the 20th century, leading physicians and medical researchers claimed that homosexuality was a pathological condition or disease, correct? Yes. Almost all of the medical literature on homosexuality in the early 20th century considered it to be a pathological condition or disease, correct? Yes. But the medical literature was incorrect. Isn't that right? Uh, well, certainly um, researchers today would, yes, say that that literature was incorrect. Such hostile medical pronouncements provided a powerful source of legitimation to anti-homosexual sentiment, correct? Yes. Such medical pronouncements were themselves a manifestation of discrimination against gays and lesbians, correct? Uh, they reflected that and, and enhanced that. But the major institutions that once helped legitimize anti-gay hysteria have changed their positions today, correct? Uh, well, could you talk about particular institutions? That's a very general question. Well, uh, let, let's turn to uh, tab 10 in your binder. Uh, do you recall that uh, you uh, put in a declaration in the California uh, same-sex marriage cases? Yes. And uh, is tab 10 a, uh, if you turn to page 16, is that your signature? Yes. Okay, and then I'd like you to look at page 12, paragraph 28. And in the second sentence you say, major institutions that once helped legitimize anti-gay hysteria have changed their positions. And you wrote that, right? Uh, well, I did write that, but I'd like to be able to talk about particulars rather than... Um, well, so, well, yes, right. I'll say major institutions, um, that's a very general statement. 
Well, for example, uh, the American Psychiatric Association in 1973 voted to remove homosexuality from its list of mental disorders, correct? Yes. And the American Psychological Association and the American Medical Association soon followed, correct? Yes. And today, leading physicians and medical researchers no longer claim that homosexuality is a pathological condition, correct? Yes. For more than 35 years, the leading American mental health associations have made clear that homosexuality is not a pathological condition or disease, correct? Yes. Now, now let's talk about discrimination in academia. Uh, you received your undergraduate degree from Yale, is that correct? Yes. And you graduated in 1977, is that correct? Yes. And you got your PhD from Yale in 1989, is yes. that correct? Mm -hmm. And after a couple of years, you went to the University of Chicago and taught there for 15 years, is that yes. correct? And then you returned to Yale as a tenured professor, is that correct? That is correct. All right. And since returning, you've been astonished to see how much Yale has changed. Isn't that right? I, yes, I have noted many changes at Yale. And, and almost all of that change has been for the better, correct? Um, I, that's my sense, yes. One of the most remarkable transformations has been in the place of the lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender students and faculty, correct? Yes. As a graduate student, even with the support of a prominent historian like Nancy Cott, you encountered considerable skepticism when you decided to write a dissertation in gay history, correct? Yes. But 20 years later, Yale hired you precisely because of that scholarship, correct? Yes. And Yale is a hospitable place to be gay, correct? Yes. And this change hasn't occurred at Yale alone, correct? Uh, it hasn't occurred at Yale alone, although I would hardly take Yale as a bellwether for the entire United States. <laughs> <laughs> Thank heavens. Uh, th th there has been a, a sea change in the place of lesbians, gays, bisexual, and transgender people in American society in the last generation, correct? Um, as I've already said, yes, I've noted um, uh, dramatic changes in the place of gay people in American society. That's also included dramatic escalation in opposition to gay rights. Now, let's talk about discrimination in the news media, and I'd like to direct your attention to tw tab 12 in your binder. Um, and this is an excerpt from a report uh, by Kenneth Miller, uh, and uh, it, it shows on the second page the 15 largest newspapers by circulation in the state of California, and all of them were opposed to Proposition 8. Is it a fair to say that uh, the news media in California is supportive of gay rights? Uh, you show these editorials, and I'm sure these editorials were there. I, it would be, I don't feel I'm in a position to broadly characterize the news media in California. Okay. Um, do, do you read the New York Times with some frequency? I do read the New York Times. All right. And uh, the New York Times is supportive of the rights of gays and lesbians, correct? Yes, the editorial pages of the Times are supportive of those rights. Okay. And it's, it's one of the most influential papers in the United States, correct? Uh, for many people, and of course it's reviled by many others. <laughs> <laughs> I understand. Uh, let's talk about uh, television. Uh, in your report in this case, you drew on statistics concerning the number of uh, regular gay characters in television melodramas and sitcoms in the 1990s. Do you recall that? Yes. Okay, and you found there was an increase in the number of regular gay characters on television melodramas and sitcoms, correct? Yes. And during the 1990s, gay and lesbian characters were a regular part of the television landscape, correct? I think by the end of the 90s, they had become that, yes. And gay people became part of the cultural landscape, even for the people without openly gay friends, correct? Uh, I think more than had been the case before, yes. And this dramatically changed the dominant representation of homosexuals, correct? Uh, it certainly put forward um, a wider range of images. Some people have been critical of many of those images. Uh, I feel that they rehearse certain stereotypes, not uh, uh, ominous ones I discussed yesterday, um, but the more gender-bending ones. But um, 
Yes, I do think that they um, increased the range of images available to people, even though certainly other images persisted. And it didn't just increase the range, it dramatically changed the dominant representation of homosexuals, correct? Um, yes, by increasing the variety of images, it, it did um, mean that there were many images out there as opposed to a handful of um, just hostile images. And some of the images, uh, Will and Grace was an immensely popular TV show. Uh, Will and Grace was an immensely popular TV show. Uh, and, and you, you uh, didn't think it was, uh, bore anti-gay hostility, did you? Uh, uh, no, I did not. I know some people feel that it um, played on the sort of comedic role of gay people. Um, but let's now talk about movies. Uh, in your direct testimony, uh, you referenced uh, a censorship uh, code that Hollywood used to have, is that right? Yes. Uh, and it was replaced in the 1960s with the rating systems we're accustomed to know today, is that right? Yes. And when the censorship code was no longer in effect, it meant that there could, for the first time in a long time, uh, it, it was possible to discuss homosexuality overtly, correct? Yes. And you would agree that it was important that there were films that included gay characters, correct? Yes. The movie Philadelphia was the first Hollywood studio film to address AIDS, correct? Uh, yes, certainly the first large budget film to do so, yes. A and uh, it, it was a huge success, correct? Yes. And that was in 1993? Yes. And more recently, Brokeback Mountain was a box office success, correct? Yes, although I'm actually struck by how few such movies there are, but yes, it was. And, and it received numerous awards, did it not? Uh, I believe so. Okay, now, now let's talk about some of the uh, governmental discrimination that you referenced during your direct testimony. In the 1980s, gay rights activists secured the enactment of gay rights ordinances in 40 cities, counties, and suburbs, bringing the total to 80, is that right? Yes. And uh, there are more today, aren't there? Yes. Uh, just recently, uh, Salt Lake City passed an ordinance that extended uh, protection against discrimination in the workplace to gays and lesbians. Is that right? Uh, I was not aware of that, but I'm sure it's true if you say it is. Okay. <laughs> uh, in California, over the last decade, there's been a consistent track record of the legislature voting in favor of extending rights to gays and lesbians. Is that correct? Um, I would have to review the California record more um, fully to give you an adequate answer to that, but certainly there have been a number of votes in the California state legislature supportive of gay rights. And, and looking at the federal government, it, it's true that the federal government once prohibited the employment of homosexuals, correct? Yes. But today, the federal government now prohibits its agencies from discriminating against homosexuals in employment, correct? Well, the military continues to um, discriminate against homosexuals in its employment. And, and we'll talk about that, but with that uh, footnote, uh, uh, ag federal agencies are prohibited from discriminating against gays and lesbians, correct? Yes. Okay. Uh, in, in the House of Representatives, gays and lesbians have a powerful ally in Speaker Nancy Pelosi, correct? Uh, what do you mean by an ally, a powerful ally? Someone who's a champion of their cause. Um, well, I'm not sure I would accept that assessment. There are a range of issues that gay rights groups have put before the Congress that they'd like to um, see put forward, and um, with the exception of the hate crimes law, uh, they have not moved forward. So I think that many people would question how powerful an ally Nancy uh, Pelosi has been of the um, gay rights movement. Didn't uh, the House of Representatives uh, pass ENDA, the, the Employment Non-Discrimination Act? Has the House of Representatives yes, passed ENDA? Uh, well, well, we'll move on. Uh, no, no, law, no lawmaker would grant a homosexual a hearing in the 1950s, correct? Um, uh, right, no lawmakers would grant a hearing to uh, but, homosexuals. But today, uh, 
Congressman, you would concede that Congressman Barney Frank is a powerful ally of gays and lesbians, correct? Uh, I would agree that he is um, uh, uh, a strong supporter of gay rights, so he's often been criticized by gay rights groups. And uh, Senator Boxer is an ally of gays and lesbians? Um, well, in what sense do you mean an ally of gays and lesbians? Someone who supports their causes. Um, I would need to review the particulars of her record, although um, I think she's been supportive of some issues, but I would need to look at her record in particular. Over the last decade, labor unions have consistently supported the rights of gays and lesbians, correct? Uh, well, that's a very large uh, generalization, um, and I'm sure when you say that, uh, do you mean support in the sense of passing a resolution or support in the sense of mobilizing their activists to go out and support a particular bill or uh, or giving money or I mean unions um, gave a lot of money to defeat prop 8 isn't that right uh, I don't know that but I uh, would have to ask what level of support you're talking about I don't know that unions um, even if they've passed resolution that they've actually dedicated resources um, that uh, both in volunteer power, staffing, um, mobilization of people, uh, and money. Um. Now, now, you believe that the federal government was slow to respond to the AIDS crisis, correct? Uh, yes. And in your opinion, the association of this, dis this disease with a despised group is a significant part of why the government responded so slowly, correct? Uh, I do think that that's one of the reasons, yes. And funding of AIDS research is an important priority to the gay and lesbian community, correct? Yes. It's fair to say that even today, a majority of Americans would still think that homosexuals would be more likely to have AIDS than heterosexuals, correct? Uh, I haven't seen that study, but I imagine that's the case. And if we look at the level of funding today uh, it, uh, for AIDS research, it has increased dramatically since the early days of the AIDS crisis, correct? Uh, yes, though, of course, any increase would be dramatic, given how little there was initially. Yes. Do you have a rough idea as to how much money a year the federal government spends on AIDS research? Um, no, but I, I do think it is a significant amount. Okay. Um, now, you testified that not all states have bans on discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation, but isn't it true that thousands of private employers have adopted non-discrimination measures? Um, many have, uh, certainly. It could be thousands. Well, let, let's look at your California report, which was behind tape, tab 10, uh, paragraph 28. And uh, it's page 13. And you say in the third full sentence, a substantial number of cities and counties have prohibited discrimination based on sexual orientation. Thousands of private employers have adopted similar measures. And that was true when you wrote that. I, it must have been. I would have just reviewed that literature at that time, which I haven't just done now. OK. Uh, local gay rights ordinances became in the 1980s an important barometer of public attitudes towards homosexuality, correct? Uh, yes. Local gay rights ordinances also became an important barometer of the relative strength of pro and anti-gay forces, correct? Uh, yes, in the context of the referendum battles over gay rights laws, yes. The efforts of gays and lesbians collectively constituted a massive and remarkably successful grassroots campaign to challenge the misconceptions uh, and daily habits sustaining anti-gay bigotry, correct? Um, I think over the sweep of the last third, um, generation, yes, it is remarkable uh, the change that's been produced, even as it's produced a reaction. As a result of both individual and collective efforts, gay political clout has grown in many parts of the country, correct? I'm sorry. I'm sure. Yeah. As, as a result of both individual and collective efforts, gay political clout has grown in many parts of the country, correct? Uh, yes. I mean, certainly in parts of the country, yes.
and and a growing number of heterosexuals have taken up the causes, uh, the, have taken up gay causes as their own, correct? Uh, yes, more heterosexuals have come to support gay rights, yes. Although the statistics are imprecise, the best figures we have now, in your opinion, are that somewhere between 2 and 5 percent of the population is gay and lesbian, correct? Uh, yes. And the support for the 2 to 5 percent number comes from a study by the University of Chicago researcher Edward Lauman, correct? Uh, yes. I, so I recall he was in the 2 to 3 percent. Category. It, it was one of the most highly regarded of the studies that were conducted at the time in the 90s, correct? Yes. Uh, Your Honor, we would move the admission. This is a plaintiff's expert uh, exhibit, PX 943. It's the Edward Lauman study that was just referenced. We'd ask the court to take judicial notice of it. PX 943. 43. Very well. 943 is admitted. And even as early as 1992, there was a distinct shift towards support for gay people evident in the presidential election year when gay issues moved to the center of the national debate for the first time, correct? Um, well, I think that in 1992, um, yes, on the one hand, you um, had a major presidential candidate, Bill Clinton, who voice support for gay rights um, more forcefully than it had been done in the past. Uh, and you had a very um, strong uh, conservative position uh, in the Republican Party on gay rights. Um, and President Clinton became the first president to appoint openly gay officials, correct? Uh, yes. And in fact, he appointed more than 150 openly gay officials to his uh, administration, correct? Yes. President Clinton issued executive orders banning discrimination in the federal workplace on the basis of sexual orientation, correct? Yes. And he, uh, President Clinton issued executive orders barring the use of sexual orientation as a criterion for determining security clearance, correct? Yes. And uh, you've stated that, uh, and you would agree, that at, at the national level, gay advocates remained relatively powerless to win gay rights protections in the 1990s, correct? Yes. And when you use the phrase relatively powerless, what you mean is gay activists and their supporters had reached the point where they could at least have their issues considered but they had not achieved the power to win the proposals that they put forward at the federal level or to defend them against determined opposition. Yes, yes or no? Yes. Uh, the federal government now prohibits agencies from discriminating against homosexuals in employment, correct? Yes. And uh, uh, surveys of the largest employers in the United States show that more than 90 percent of them have adopted anti-discrimination measures that protect the rights of gays and lesbians, correct? Yes. I beg your pardon. Never mind. Objection withdrawn. And in the past, <clears throat> in the past, state and local governments used to try to ferret out and discharge their homosexual em employees, correct? Yes. But that's no longer the case today, is it? Uh, no, those employees still report large levels of discrimination, but no, they do not. Um, they are not ferreted out by state agencies now. And, and federal and local agencies in the past sought to curtail gay people's freedom of speech, correct? Yes. But that's no longer the case today, correct? Correct. And homosexuals used to be barred from entry into the United States, correct? Correct. But that's no longer the case today, correct? Correct. Okay. Um, now, let's talk about don't ask, don't tell. Um, and during the Second World War, the armed forces put in place screening mechanisms designed to ferret out homosexuals during the induction process, correct? Yes. The military, however, no longer tries to screen out homosexuals during the induction process, correct? 
I assume that's the case. I'm, I don't understand the exact workings of this. Military police used to cooperate in anti-vice raids against gay bars and other meeting places, correct? Yes. But the military or police no longer conduct anti-vice raids against gay bars, correct? Uh, I assume that's correct. Uh, the, the don't, you testified yesterday that the don't ask, don't tell policy was a compromise. Is that right? Uh, yes. Okay. And, and Your Honor, if I may, I think uh, we have some additional, uh, an additional binder. May I uh, get that and pass that around? Of course. Thank you, Your Honor. Bad, uh, we're not all in the notebook business. <laughs> oh, actually, can I have that one back? And, uh, Professor, I'd like to direct your attention to uh, tab. 14A, it actually says Exhibit A, but it's after 14, uh, and specifically to pages 9 and 10 of this document, which is uh, produced uh, by the Congressional Research Service. It's entitled, Don't Ask, Don't Tell the Law and Military Policy on Same-Sex Behavior. And, and we can see that uh, when President Reagan was the president, uh, close to 2,000 individuals in 1982 were discharged from the armed services, correct? Uh, yes. And uh, in the year immediately before Don't Ask, Don't Tell was put in place, 949 individuals were discharged in 1991, right? I'm sorry, what page are you? Oh, okay. oh sorry, if you turn the page. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, but in 2008, under President George W. Bush, only 634 individuals were discharged, correct? Uh, that's correct, although I believe that the size of the military had declined. So as I look at the percentages, they go up and down. Um, and we have um, roughly the same percentage being discharged in 2008 as were discharged in 1989. But as compared to President Reagan in 1982, it's less than half, correct? Um, a little bit more than, uh, yes, that was the high point under President Reagan. Um, so you're referring to what page, uh, Mr. Oh, yes, uh, that's End? page uh, 9 End? has the uh, Reagan numbers and page 10 has the more recent numbers. Here. Right, of course, another one of the Reagan numbers is from 1988 where it's uh, roughly the same percentage discharged as in 2008. And, and in your report, you, you truncated your analysis at the year 2000, is that right? Uh, yes. <clears throat> now let's look at uh, the, inner, the role of courts and the level of discrimination that's been directed against gays and lesbians in the courts, Professor. Um, Courts used to be able to confine individuals deemed in need of a cure for what was termed their homosexual pathology, correct? Yes. That, that doesn't happen anymore, does it, in this country? Uh, no, I don't believe it does. Okay, so that's a form of discrimination that's vanished, correct? Um, I, I don't, uh, yes. Um, and, and was the Supreme Court's decision in Bowers versus Hardwick, in your opinion, itself a reflection of moral disapproval of gays and lesbians? Uh, well, certainly there were indications in the supporting opinions of that and in the way they um, construed the sodomy law at issue itself um, and made it an anti-homosexual law. And in fact, it was the law that 
penalize heterosexual as well as homosexual intercourse of certain kinds. Now, uh, courts in Connecticut and Massachusetts, Iowa, California have all held that gays and lesbians have a constitutional right to marry under their state constitutions, correct? Yes. And those court decisions reflect increased level of support for the rights of gays and lesbians, correct? Uh, well, I think those court decisions um, reflect the rulings of the decisions of those courts that there was a, a guarantee of equality, equal protection, um, uh, and that they in and of themselves may not have reflected uh, growth of support. They certainly uh, went against um, uh, much public opinion. Now let's talk about uh, religion and discrimination against gays and lesbians. Uh, the first American laws against homosexual conduct were rooted in the earliest English settlers understanding of the religious and secular traditions that prohibited sodomy, correct? Yes. And what were the secular traditions that prohibited sodomy? Uh, well, those grew out of the English Reformation Parliament's secularization of the law. Uh, and, and Puritan New England penalized many forms of uh, carnal knowledge, including adultery, fornication, and men lying with men, correct? Yes. And, and Puritan clergy in the New England colonies were especially vigorous in their denunciation of sodomy as contrary to God's will, correct? Yes. The condemnation of the Puritan clergy was motivated by the pressing need to increase the population and to secure the stability of the family, as well as their reading of the scripture, correct? Uh, that is what a number of historians have argued, and I think it's probably correct. And the Puritans had no concept of homosexuals as a distinct minority of humankind, correct? Um, they certainly, uh, the Puritan clergy did not, um, this was not a term available to them. Um, you know, it gets a little more complex when we look at the reality of sort of the on the ground engagement with people. But yes, that there was no concept of the homosexual as such. And uh, Puritans believed that all men and women uh, were uh, children of fallen humanity and thus sinners, correct? Yes. And even today, conservative Christian traditions teach that all men and women are sinners, correct? Yes. We all know how divided our churches are today over the issue of homosexuality, correct? Yes. Religious attitudes have begun to change, though, correct? Yes. In the 1970s, many mainline Protestant denominations issued official statements condemning discrimination against homosexuals and affirming that homosexuals ought to enjoy equal protection under criminal and civil law, correct? Uh, yes, so of course, as I go on to say, the passage you're quoting, they continue to debate the place of gay people in the religious life of the church, and they represent a fairly small percentage of religious affiliations in the United States. Several of these groups descended from the historically influential denominations whose religious authority had been invoked to justify colonial sodomy statutes and the policing of homosexuality as one more sign of urban vice, correct? Yes. The Christian right's fierce opposition to gay rights is already a minority position among Protestant denominations, correct? Um. No, I think I'm. I wrote that, and I'm. I'm not sure that that's correct. But you uh, did write that. Uh, yes, and I do occasionally make mistakes. The Lutheran Church in America has issued a statement in support of gay rights. Correct. Yes. The Unitarian Universalist Association has issued a statement in support of gay rights, correct? Yes. The United Methodist Church has issued a statement in support of gay rights, correct? Yes. The United Church of Christ has issued a statement in support of gay rights, correct? Yes. The Protestant Episcopal Church has issued a statement in support of gay rights, correct? Uh, I believe so, yes. 
of the Disciples of Christ has issued a statement in support of gay rights, correct? Yes. The United Presbyterian Church in the United States has issued a statement in support of gay rights, correct? Yes. Many clergy have offered their support to gays and lesbians by making their churches available for gay meetings, correct? Uh, yes. And the Unitarians, Quakers, and Methodists were specially noted for this, correct? Yes. In the last generation, a growing number of faiths have begun to celebrate the marriages of same-sex couples, correct? Uh, yes, although it still encompasses a tiny percentage of people, religious affiliations in the United States. Uh, on the day same-sex marriage became legal in Massachusetts, the Unitarians, Reform Judaism, Reconstructionist Judaism, and the Metropolitan Community Church encouraged their clergy to officiate at such weddings, correct? Uh, yes, and altogether that would account for churches representing a very small percentage of the American population. Uh, I'd like to ask uh, permission to play a, a video on the screen, if possible. This is uh, DIX 2648. It's uh, a short video relating to the D.C. City Council just passed a bill uh, permitting same-sex marriage in the District of Columbia. Were you aware of that, Professor? And uh, the, the signing was in a church. Were you aware of that? Uh, no. But, uh, can we? Uh, oh, yes. DIX 2648. Well, I, I hope that it will be in evidence. Uh, but we'd like to play it and then and then want to play it before it's in evidence or, or well we, we I, either way we, we would uh, move we would ask the court to take judicial notice of this video that comes from the Washington Post website your honor any objection Ms. Stewart your honor, I'd like to reserve objection until we see the video I am not familiar with it so fair enough one of the advantages of a bench trial <laughs> in sanctuaries just like this one uh, all across the city. So we are, we are excited. We're looking forward to being able to exercise our religious. Does the signing of the D.C. bill allowing same-sex marriage in a church symbolize the growing support uh, among f for same-sex marriage among certain faiths? Uh, uh, <coughs> excuse me. As I've said, um, yes, there is growing support in the churches, although those churches um, represent a very small percentage of people with religious affiliation in the United States. So I, there is a growing debate, but um, the uh, churches overall are still opposed to this. Ms. Stewart, objection to 2648? admission into evidence because I don't think it's relevant. It shows very little. It doesn't give any sense of, I mean, we saw two religious leaders 
supporting marriage equality. I don't think that's a terribly relevant fact. Well, uh, the, the witness has uh, addressed a matter related to it, and I think I'll admit it for uh, the value that it may have. So uh, 2648 will be admitted. Now, many evangelical Christians continue to oppose same-sex marriage, correct? Yes. But it is less acceptable to demonize homosexuals today than it used to be, correct? Uh, yes, I believe in um, many circles it is. And uh, Rick Warren is a prominent evangelical minister, is that correct? Yes. He wrote The Purpose Driven Life, is that correct? Yes. It's a big bestseller, is that correct? That's my understanding. All right, and, and let's hear what uh, I'd like uh, the court's permission to play a short video um, uh, from Rick Warren. I'm not intending, Your Honor, to offer it into evidence. I just want to get the reaction from the witnesses to uh, how this compares in the history of discrimination. He spoke yesterday about what Jerry Falwell, one of the leaders of the Christian right, said about homosexuals in the 1950s. I'd like to ask him whether uh, Pastor Warren's comments here reflect a, a change in attitudes among the religious community that continues to oppose same-sex marriage. Your Honor, I, um, I would like to um, reserve um, my objection because I haven't determined whether we've worked out authentication issues on this document. I, I, we may have, but uh, I'm afraid I don't know at this moment. So um, I don't I mean, if, I don't want to get in the way of the witness showing it, but I may object to its admission. I don't know if it's an authentic document. All right. Well, let's, let's deal with the matter after we've heard the okay. excerpt and uh, the witness has been asked to address it. Thank you. I want to ask you about a couple other things. We've covered a lot of ground here, but uh, I was reading where, where some members of your congregation were very disappointed, in, particularly, in particular a gay member of your congregation, that you had come out in favor of Proposition 8. She said, you know, what do I do? Do I go inside the congregation or do I stand outside the Saddleback Church and protest? And she was conflicted about that. So I'm kind of curious because you normally have not taken strong political positions. What's your, you know, how do you deal with your you congregation know, Alan, Alan, being a little disappointed I, I, here? I absolutely believe in loving everybody, giving respect to everybody, and giving everybody the freedom of choice. I just opposed to redefining marriage. For 5,000 years, that term, marriage, has represented a man and a woman. Uh, and so uh, even some of uh, gay leaders like Al Rantel, KABC, and others have said, yeah. why would we redefine marriage? Do you want... Should they have domestic rights? Should they have the same legal rights as anybody else? Should they be allowed to I, live I in partnerships with... Go ahead. I absolutely believe that people should show respect to everybody, regardless of their lifestyle, uh, regardless of their beliefs, religious beliefs, or any other kind of belief. I think we live in a pluralistic society where we have to get along with each other and show common grace to each other. But I, I just didn't believe in redefining marriage. Well, there are some legal issues involved. Let me ask you about the. Um, so, Professor. This represents a stark shift from the rhetoric of Jerry Falwell when Rick Warren talks of love and respect for all people, correct? Um, say love? He did, Your Honor. He, um, he uh, talked about freedom of choice. He talked about a lifestyle. Uh, really, the suggestion was that homosexuality is a choice. Um, he uh, did not demonize gay people, uh, but he also um, clearly did not think that their uh, relationships deserve to be treated as equal to um, heterosexual relationships. Now, the, the, the bottom line of all the discussion we've had this morning is that there has been a significant shift in public opinion toward acceptance of gay people, correct? Uh, there have been, there has been a shift in public opinion uh, and growing support for gay people and gay people continue to encounter tremendous hostility. Now, uh, in terms of the level of discrimination against gays and lesbians in California, you would agree that there are certainly many indications that large numbers of gay people have left more hostile settings for the relative openness of California, correct? Uh, there are indications that people have migrated here um, because it's 
less hostile than where they came from. And, and California has more protections for gays and lesbians against discrimination than any other state, correct? Um, I, I don't know that as a precise fact, but um, there's certainly many protections in California. All right, now you, you talked, you were asked yesterday about the purposes uh, and effect of Proposition 8. And, uh, and more generally, you had some prefatory remarks about, I believe, uh, 60 ballot initiatives that were directed at gays and lesbians. Do you recall that? Yes. And uh, how many of those 60 ballot initiatives were in California? Um. Uh, I'm not sure, and I wasn't bringing, and I think in that particular figure I was basing on something that had not come into the, um, into the, the last decade. Um, but, so I'm not sure precisely, really. There were several. And, and do you know what the win, winning percentage was for the gay and lesbian community in California as opposed to the rest of the country was? I'm sorry, could you briefly Well, did, did you question? testify yesterday that uh, two-thirds of the uh, initiatives uh, had uh, prevailed against the will of the gay and lesbian community? I think I testified that three-quarters had. Three-quarters, I apologize, yes. And, um, but do you know what the percentage is for California? Uh, no, I don't. Uh, but, but the Briggs Initiative, uh, that, that came before the people in California in the 1970s, correct? Correct. It would have prohibited public <coughs> school teachers from saying anything that could be construed as advocating homosexuality, correct? Correct. And gay rights groups appro opposed the Briggs Initiative, correct? Um, uh, gay rights groups and many teachers groups which were very concerned about this and even noted politicians opposed to it. Like Ronald Reagan. Like Ronald Reagan, yes. That seemed a quite ominous um, censorship of teachers. And the people of California sided with the gay rights groups in rejecting the Briggs Initiative, correct? Yes. Now, as I mentioned, you were also asked about the purposes behind Prop 8. And I'd like to uh, quote from you uh, something that President Obama said in his book, The Audacity of Hope, where he said, I believe that American society can choose to carve out a special place for the union of a man and a woman as the unit of child rearing most common to every culture. In your opinion, does pre do President Obama's views on same-sex marriage reflect moral disapproval of gays and lesbians? Um, I believe that they reflect um, a sense that gay relationships are not equal to heterosexual relationships. They don't deserve that same um, recognition. Well, that's, that's almost definitionally and tautologically true. My question is, in terms of his motivation, and you spoke to the, the purposes behind Prop 8, which is why I'm asking you this, do you believe that that statement by President Obama reflects moral disapproval of gays and lesbians? Um, I, I'm re reluctant to plumb the mind of a um, uh, presidential candidate, um, but I, it's hard for me to assess what uh, Barack Obama meant in that. So is it possible for someone to have the position that he articulated and not to morally disapprove of gays and lesbians? Um, uh, it would be possible, certainly, though, as I've said, I believe it reflects a belief in the inequality of lesbian and gay relationships. Right. I'd, I'd like to direct your attention to your uh, to tab 16 in your binder, which is the California Supreme Court's decision in the in re marriage uh, decisions. And in particular, I'd like to direct your attention to footnote 73 which appears at page 61, I believe, in this printout. And, and as you'll recall, Professor, this decision dealt with the validity of Proposition 22. Do you recall that? Okay, and tell me when you're there. Okay. 
Okay, and in the first sentence, uh, the Supreme Court of California said, we emphasize that in reaching this conclusion, meaning the conclusion of invalidating Prop 22, we do not suggest that the current marriage provisions were enacted with an invidious intent or purpose. Do you agree that Prop 22 was not enacted with an invidious intent or purpose? Uh, it's not clear to me what they're referring to when they say the current marriage provisions. Well, let's say that's Prop 22. Uh, you're not referring, this is not referring to longstanding um, in current marriage provisions. I, I'm sorry, I just need a little more context for this to be able to assess it. But well, you are an expert in this case, right? Uh, yes. I submitted an affidavit in yeah, this case. But but yes, it is, it's Prop 22 that's at issue here. Uh, okay, I'm just sorry. I, I need a little more context to understand what they're saying here. Well, l let me just ask, wholly apart from what they're saying, let me ask you what your opinion is. Do you, do you have an opinion as to whether Proposition 22 in California was passed because of invidious discriminatory intent? Um, again, I believe it reflected a belief in the inequality of gay relationships. It w and, and then the question becomes, what's the source of that uh, belief? And do you believe that it was um, reflected uh, uh, an invidious animus and hatred of gays and lesbians? Um, I think that to talk about uh, hatred of um, uh, lesbians and gay men um, would only account for some, that there are others who um, would not certainly express hatred towards lesbians or gay men, um, but would still regard them as um, unequal uh, and their relationships as not deserving the same um, status. Uh, and rights as heterosexual relationships do, and I think that's premised on a belief in the inferiority of such relationships. Uh, Professor, I'd like to direct your attention to tab 17. This is um, DIX 81. It's an excerpt from Jonathan Rausch's book, which is entitled uh, Gay Marriage, Why It is Good for Gays, Good for Straits, and Good for America. Uh, and are you uh, uh, aware of Mr. Rausch? Are you, do you know of uh, him? I, I know of him. Yes. Uh, Your Honor, we would ask the court to take judicial notice of DIX 81. Well. <clears throat> and, um, Professor, I'd like to uh, direct your attention to um, page 7 of this book. And... Uh, on the right-hand column, third sentence from the bottom, Mr. Rausch. And, and Mr. Rausch is an advocate for same-sex marriage, correct? Yes. And, and he's openly gay, is that correct? Yes. Okay, and he says, some gay marriage opponents may be bigoted or homophobic or otherwise out to get gay people, but most of them are motivated by a sincere desire to do what's best for their marriages, their children, their society. Isn't it true that there are some people among the 7 million Californians who voted for Prop 8 who fall into precisely this category? Um, you know, it's difficult for me to know the variety of reasons in which people, for which people uh, opposed marriage. Um, uh, it's easier for me to comment on the sort of arguments that were made against um, marriage equality by the Prop 8 advocates and to assess the um, uh, various reasons that people might have opposed this. So you just don't know why people opposed Prop 8? I mean, it supported Prop 8. Um, well, I assume that there were a range of reasons that people uh, supported Prop 8, um, but that the, an underlying premise of them was that gay relationships were unequal. But would some of the people within that range, and I understand it's a range and that there are all sorts of reasons, but would some of the people in California, some of the 7 million 
who voted for Proposition 8 fall into the category that Mr. Rausch indicates here? Um, yes, but we'd have to ask why people um, believe that um, opposing marriage equality is best for their marriages, their children, and society. Um, Your Honor, I'd like permission to play a very short uh, video, which is DIX 2553. Yeah, DIX again. Uh, 2553, Your Honor. Thank you, sir. <clears throat> yes, this is uh, a uh, video of Carrie. It's a very short video, which has the excerpt of Carrie Prejean's statements and then Mayor Gavin Newsom's reaction as to her motivation for having the religious conviction she has. So I think it's, it speaks directly to the issue we're talking about, which is why is it that some people were, oppo were opposed to same-sex marriage in California? Your Honor, I would object that it's not relevant. One individual's reasons. I, I'm much more interested in what Mayor Newsom has to say about it, Your Honor. Who well, was I'm really more interested in what the witness has to say. Well, a, 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 as an, if, it, if it ties into this witness's testimony, well, I think it's appropriate. Y yes, Your Honor, and, and the, the reason uh, it, is, uh, it ties in to what is being said is it goes to, he was asked about the purposes behind Prop 8. He testified to that, and I've been asking him about why it is that some people, he's just testified there's a range of reasons why people supported Prop 8. Mayor Newsom makes a statement about that, and I like his reaction, whether he agrees with Mayor Newsom. Your Honor, we didn't put this witness up. In. The, the witness's testimony has been about the history of discrimination and the backdrop and the campaign messaging. Um, and I think this whole line of testimony is going beyond the scope of direct. And I think this, we're getting even further out on a limb with these kind of extraneous little bits of video and asking him to comment on what he believes people, other people's intent may have been, particular people. So I think it's, it's way beyond the scope, and it's also not relevant. Well, it does appear to, to certainly push the outer boundaries of the scope of direct examination, but let's see where it goes. And, thank, uh, thank you. And see what the witness's reaction is to um, the statement. Okay. Or to in terms of the form. Newsom, who gained national attention for his strong and vocal support of gay marriage, also talked about the controversy involving Carrie Prejean, a San Diego resident representing California in the Miss USA pageant. When asked about same-sex marriage, she said this. In my country and in, in, in my family, I think that I believe that a marriage should be between a man and a woman. Uh, I want to challenge her on her point of view. She challenged me on my point of view, and she uh, spoke her conscience. What more can you ask? Uh, uh, I speak my conscience, she should speak hers, and so I think she's been a little unfairly. Um, would you agree, Professor, with Mayor Newsom, that some people who take the position that Carrie Prejean did are simply speaking their conscience? Objection, Your Honor. Uh, we'll move on, Your Honor. Um, The uh, quest for equal rights in marriage has always been a contentious issue within the gay movement itself, correct? Uh, initially, it was much more content contentious. Um, I think that there's been a shift uh, amongst gay activists to fairly widespread support for gay marriage. But, but it's always been a contentious issue, correct? Uh, Again, I think there's been a shift uh, in the tenor of that debate amongst gay activists so that it was um, very contentious at one point and there's much more widespread support for this uh, now. There was a time when support for gay marriage was a distinctly minority position in the lesbian and gay movement, correct? Uh, 
amongst lesbian and gay activists, uh, uh, people who uh, were uh, lesbian and gay organizers, uh, there was uh, uh, minority support, certainly we have indications of this, um, amongst ordinary lesbians and gay men, um, indications would be otherwise, actually, there probably was more support early on. Well, isn't it true that one critic in a New York uh, newspaper uh, wrote, this isn't the freedom we want, and this was a gay writer? Uh, and what's the date on that? Uh, it, it's in your book, uh, Why Marriage, at page 93. I know, and I'd like to get the date on it. Sure. Uh, it's p page 93. That's behind uh, tab 6. Now, your book has footnotes, and so we may not. But I'm happy to let you look at it to see if it reflects your recollection. Right, the newspaper was nine, called nine. Uh, 93, sir. And, and it's uh, a newspaper entitled Gay Power. So I don't know if that helps with the date, because maybe it was only printed for a while. Right. It was a fairly short-lived publication, um, late 60s, early 70s. Okay. Um, and, and that editorial captured the dominant spirit among gay male liberationists for whom liberation centered on sexual liberation, correct? Uh, yes, I believe it uh, reflected down attitude of gay activists at that time. And it, it is pretty clear that the majority sentiment among gay rights activists was not interested in marriage as an issue at that time, correct? At that time, that's probably correct. Okay, and most lesbian feminist activists were even less interested in pursuing marriage rights, correct? Uh, that's probably correct, yes. This was the 1960s? And, and 70s. 1960s and 70s we're talking about. Uh, that's the height of the sexual revolution. Um, and after an initial flurry of activity, marriage virtually disappeared as a goal of the gay rights movement, correct? Uh, yes, because as I pointed out in the book, there were actually a number of lesbian and gay activists who did um, seek the right to marriage um, and thought it was due them uh, as it was to heterosexuals, uh, but it receded as an issue for a while. But, but the courts dismissed their petitions as preposterous, correct? Yes. And most lesbian and gay activists agreed, correct? Uh, I think for many people in that period, the idea that the courts would recognize um, gay couples' right to marry just seemed uh, unimaginable. And, and that was true of, of gay rights activists too, correct? Yes. Yeah. Now, some feminists, such as the founder of the ACLU's Lesbian and Gay Rights Project, Nan Hunter, regarded marriage as a more flexible institution, which had been profoundly changed since the 1970s and would be changed again by the inclusion of same-sex couples, correct? Uh, I believe that was the argument Nan Hunter made. And, and some gay men and lesbians felt making marriage a central movement goal or even supporting it would dishonor the innovative forms of intimacy that had taken shape in their culture, correct? Uh, would you refresh me on what period we've moved into in this account? Um, well, we can look at your book, uh, page 121. So I think in this section I'm describing the um, emergence of the debate over uh, within the gay movement over marriage in the uh, 1980s uh, 
and early 90s uh, when it became more an issue again and received attention, uh, extensive attention. Uh, and certainly some gay activists um, opposed uh, the movement for marriage equality. Uh, and I'm beginning here to describe the sort of period in which uh, the um, uh, shift in um, sentiment uh, occurred in which uh, the right to marry became a more widespread and deeply held goal of many gay activists. Your, Your Honor, uh, I, I was wondering if we might take our morning break um, uh, soon. Maybe, maybe you were close to finishing with this witness. Well, uh, I think if I have a break, I might be able to separate some of the wheat from the chaff and streamline this a little bit, but I, I am getting closer, Your Honor. Well, a promise to separate wheat from chaff is one that I can't turn down. <laughs> Thank you. Take uh, until 15 minutes after the hour. Thank you, Your Honor. <laughs>